Horizon Zero Dawn was one of the most anticipated games of 2017, and when it came out, it did the impossible. It met the hype, and then some. And while it did everything we expected it to do, from delivering a beautiful, lush game world to putting us right in the middle of intense battles with mechanical dinosaurs, it also ended up doing so much more. Because not only is Horizon one of the most enjoyable and best-looking games of the year, it also tells one of the most ambitious, engrossing, and well-written stories we've seen from a video game in a long, long time. Right from its very first minute, Horizon pulls us into its beautiful, mysterious world, and it just refuses to let go till the very last second. And it does so in so many ways, bringing countless moving parts together expertly to form one grand narrative. From well-written characters and captivating lore to excellent world-building and some fantastic pacing, Horizon Zero Dawn has all the things a game needs to tell an excellent story. Its story is so good, you actually can't put it out of your head, even once you're done with the game. We're still gushing over it, so why not gush over it together? Here in this feature, we're going to take a look back at the complete story of Horizon Zero Dawn, from start to finish, so strap in for one of the wildest rides imaginable. Horizon Zero Dawn is a post-apocalyptic game, but its world is nothing like traditional post-apocalypse settings you see in most video games. It is, for the lack of a better term, a post-post-apocalypse. The game is set roughly 1,000 years in the future, and everything that the Earth was long ago is now gone. After an unknown cataclysmic event 1,000 years ago, the world was ravaged and over time it was completely changed. As it stands now, nature has reclaimed Earth. Everything has gone back to its primal state. There are a lot of moving parts in the story of Horizon Zero Dawn, many of which rely on the lore establishment and world building that the game does throughout its 30 plus hours. So before we jump into the actual events that unfold during the game's narrative, Let's talk about the background and lore that is the most pivotal to the story. The most striking feature of the world of Horizon Zero Dawn, and the one that will catch your eye before anything else, is obviously the fact that mechanical beasts that look like everything from animals to birds to even dinosaurs roam the lands. There's the Sawtooth, which looks like a tiger. There's the Thunderjaw, which bears resemblance to a T-Rex. There's the Watchers, which look like Velociraptors. There's the Grazers and the Striders, which look like deer and horses, respectively. There's the Snap Maw, which resembles a crocodile. There's the Flying Glint Hawks, and that's just a few of them. What these machines really are, and what their actual purpose is, however, is a mystery. One that we will uncover slowly, but surely. What's important for now, though, is that for the most part, the inhabitants of the world and these machines have been coexisting peacefully for a long time. About 20 years ago though, due to some unknown mysterious circumstances, the machines started behaving strangely. Some of them became more aggressive and more hostile towards human beings, and in the 20 years that have followed, they have been becoming even more aggressive. The tribes of the world call this phenomenon the derangement of the machines, but that isn't even the worst part. In the last few years, larger and deadlier machines have started appearing. Machines that no one even knew existed previously. The aforementioned Sawtooth and the Thunderjaw would be examples of such machines. All of this obviously has been troubling the human inhabitants of the world, and while we do not want to belittle these obviously monumental issues, the human beings of Horizon's post-post-apocalyptic Earth do have issues of their own as well. As we said before, everything in the world has gone back to its primal state, and that includes the humans as well. The people they inherited the Earth from are now nothing more than hazy memories, known only as the Old Ones. The people that inhabit the world now have, in the absence of any knowledge and technology, regressed to a tribal culture. Obviously, there are a lot of these tribes across the landscape. Among the few that are featured the most prominently in the game, there's the Nora, a matriarchal tribe that has confined itself to a specific valley where outsiders are rarely allowed and from where the Nora are rarely allowed to leave. They hunt, they gather, and they adhere to all mother. Then there's the Kaja, desert dwellers and builders of cities that, by the standards of the now technologically deprived world, are nothing short of marvels. The Kaja, after a long period of war with another tribe known as the Osaram, 
metal workers and fierce warriors. The Karja saw massive upheaval when their current king, Sun King Avad, struck down and killed his own genocidal and famously insane father to bring an end to the bloody conflict. When the derangement of the machines began years ago, the mad Sun King Duran started making sacrifices, believing that the blood and lives of people would appease the machines and put an end to the derangement. It didn't. More than any other tribe, it was the Osaram who were constantly raided by Karja, as Duran looked for more people to capture and sacrifice. After a certain point, the Karja prince, Avad's older brother, openly questioned his father's actions, at which point the Mad King proved that the name given to his is well earned and proceeded to sacrifice his own heir. It was at this point that Avad finally decided that his father had to die. When Avad ultimately killed his father with the help of the Osirim, the two tribes became steadfast allies, and while most people hailed his actions for finally bringing about peace, a certain sect of the Karja that were loyal to the Duran broke off and formed their own tribe, now known as the Shadow Karja, and secretly led by a cult group known as Eclipse. Ever since the death of the Mad Sun King and the ascension of Sun King Avad, the Karja and the Shadow Karja have been locked in furious conflicts. For now, however, the tribe we need to focus on is the Nora. Deep in the heart of Nora land, there is a mountain. No one is allowed inside the mountain other than the Nora's priestesses, who are known as the Matriarchs. About 20 years before the events of Horizon Zero Dawn really kick into gear though, the Matriarchs found an infant girl in the heart of the mountain, on the steps of a giant sealed mechanical door. It was as if she had appeared out of nowhere, born out of nothing. One of the Matriarchs, known as Tirsa, believed that this little girl is a blessing and a gift by the All-Mother, but the other Matriarchs did not agree with this assertion. They felt she was unnatural, having been born out of nothing. They called her motherless and ultimately decided to hand her over to the care of an outcast man known as Rost. Rost named the girl Eloy, and the two lived on the outskirts of the tribe as outcasts, shunned and ignored by the Nora. The opening of Horizon Zero Dawn depicts the childhood of Eloy as she deals with persecution and discrimination from the tribe on account of her being an outcast, and more importantly, motherless. After one such encounter with bullies, a harried and disturbed Aloy finds herself falling into underground ruins made of metal and stone. She quickly figures out that these are among several underground ruins left behind by the old ones, and here she chances upon an unfamiliar mysterious device, a focus. The focus, which basically looks like a Bluetooth headset, has special perceptive abilities allowing her to interact with and gain knowledge about nearly everything she can lay her eyes on, from animals and machines to people and buildings. Soon, Aloy becomes resentful of the discrimination that she and Rost have been facing for as long as she can remember. Tired of being called motherless by everyone she sees, she demands that Rost tell her about her mother. Rost obviously doesn't have any answers for her, but he tells her that there is a way for her to get the answers she's looking for, the proving. The Proving is a Nora tradition, a competition held every year. Whoever participates in and completes the Proving is made a Nora brave, essentially knights and warriors, including outcasts such as Aloy. The winner of the Proving, however, is granted a boon above all. Basically, they are given the right to ask one thing, anything they want of the Matriarchs. Rost tells Aloy that if she wins the Proving, she can ask the Matriarchs who her mother is. Aloy is more than open to the idea, but Ross tells her that the proving is a grueling competition. Even finishing it is extremely difficult, much less winning it. The thought of not only becoming part of the tribe and no longer being an outcast, but also of finding out who her mother is, however, gives Aloy a steely determination to do whatever is needed. Ross decides to train her for as long as it takes to make sure that she's ready. And it takes a long, long time. The game skips forward by a few years. Eloy is now a young woman, having gone through a long period of intense training with Rost, and the time for the proving is almost here. Eloy heads to the Nora village where the ceremony kicking off the proving is about to take place. But before she does, she and Rost have a heartbreaking conversation. 
Once Aloy is done with the proving, she will no longer be an outcast, but Rost will still be one. Aloy tells him that she doesn't care about that, that she will willingly break Nora laws and customs, that she will still be like a daughter to him the way she has always been. But Rost, being a man who has the utmost respect for the laws of his tribe, puts his foot down. He tells Aloy that he will no longer be a part of her life once she becomes a brave, because that is what will be best for her. He tells her that the attachment she feels for him will always hold her back, and so it would be best if he is no longer a part of her life. The two argue and disagree, and on this sour note, Aloy departs for the Nora village. In the middle of the ceremony as the proving is about to begin, Aloy runs into some interesting people. One of them is Erend, an Osaram warrior who has come to the Nora Valley as part of a Kaja envoy sent by Sun King of Vard to broker and establish a peace treaty between the tribes. The person who really catches Aloy's attention, though, is Olin. He, too, is an Osaram, known for exploring ruins of the Old Ones, and is a friend of Erend's. In the middle of the ceremony, Aloy's focus picks up a signal in the vicinity, and as she investigates, she learns that Olin also has a focus, making it the only focus Aloy has ever seen in her entire life besides her own. When Aloy tries to talk to Olin about it, his behavior sets off even more alarm bells. He's awkward around her, trying to cautiously avoid her, and there's a sense of recognition in his eyes as he looks at Aloy. Aloy ultimately is unable to get anything out of Olin, and decides to put the matter aside for now and focus instead on the task at hand, the proving. Some of her fellow participants try to sabotage her, but Aloy ultimately ends up winning the proving. Her happiness is short-lived, though. On the mountaintop, where those who finish the proving stand, a group of masked killers falls upon them in devastating fashion, killing almost everyone present. Aloy fights them off with some of the survivors, but they just keep coming. And here's the insane part, they're all wearing focuses as well. As the fight wears on, one of the killers, a brute of a man who is apparently their leader, grabs Aloy by her neck, and just as he's about to finish her off, Rost intervenes and engages the man in a fight. For all his talk of cutting himself out of her life, Rost just couldn't stand the thought of not keeping an eye on his surrogate daughter. The intense skirmish ends with a massive explosion, which sends an unconscious Aloy tumbling down the mountainside. Unfortunately, the explosion also kills Rost. When Aloy wakes up, she hardly has time to register the flurry of events that just raced past her. In the heat of the fight on the mountaintop, Aloy had managed to nick a focus off one of the killers. When she wakes up after realizing that she is in the heart of the sacred Nora mountain, she scans the focus she picked up with her own focus, and she makes some startling discoveries. It turns out that the killers were targeting Aloy because she looks almost exactly like another woman. Their DNA scans via the focus show a 99.47% match. This leads to the question of whether this mysterious woman is Aloy's mother. What's interesting, though, is the fact that the killers scanned and tracked Aloy and the fact that she looks like this woman through Olin's focus. Aloy meets with the matriarchs, who tell Aloy that the mysterious attackers can somehow control machines as well and that they've launched an assault on Nora territory. Aloy asks Matriarch Tirsa about her mother, but the priestess, unfortunately, doesn't have any answers for her either. She tells her that the Matriarchs had found her years ago in front of a large sealed steel door in the Sacred Mountain itself, the very door they believe to be the representation of the All-Mother. When Aloy sees the door for herself, it ends up scanning her biometrics, once again showing a DNA match with the woman from earlier. On the basis of this DNA match, a voice from the door, which the matriarchs think of as the All-Mother's voice, informs Aloy that she has access to whatever it is that's behind the door. Due to a glitch in its system, however, it is unable to open. Aloy shares all this new information with Tiersa and the other matriarchs, and they all come to the conclusion that these circumstances need to be investigated, not just for Aloy's personal stakes, but also because the entire tribe is now in danger and currently under attack. As such, they make Aloy an official seeker of the Nora tribe. What, you say, is a seeker? Seekers have the authority to tread past Nora boundaries, something which the tribe's law otherwise prohibits. 
Having been anointed as a seeker, Aloy decides that she needs to head for Meridian, the capital city of the Kaja Kingdom, to look for Olin. Meridian is unlike any other place Aloy has ever seen. The Kaja are known for making glorious cities, and for good reason too. Meridian is a perfect illustration of their abilities. In the middle of a desert and surrounded by canyons, desert forests and oases, Meridian is a beautiful city, unmatched in terms of grandeur and scale, boasting tall buildings, countless bridges, beautiful architecture and countless landmarks. One of its most prominent and noteworthy landmarks is the Spire, a tall monolithic tower made of steel, towering over the city and the entire canyon. The Spire can be seen from a long, long distance away across the desert, and it's almost synonymous with the beauty and luster of Meridian. When Aloy gets to Meridian, and she seeks out Erend, and when she tells him about Olin and his possible involvement with a group that attacked the Nora, Erend is obviously taken aback, especially since Olin is a friend of his. Regardless, he agrees to help look for him. The two of them investigate his house and discover that Olin is indeed working with the killers, but also that he's only doing so because they're holding his family hostage. Thanks to some helpful pointers given to her by Erend, Aloy is successful in finally locating Olin at a dig site. When Aloy gets there, though, she realizes that Olin is not alone. A large group of the same mysterious killers that attacked the Nora's sacred land is there with him. Even worse, all of them are wearing focuses, meaning that they can possibly track and sense Aloy if she gets too close. And it's not just these killers by themselves, either. A few corruptors, apparently under their control, are also in the area with them as well. What exactly are corruptors? They're machines that have the ability to corrupt other machines, which essentially means that they can override other machines and bring them under their own control. Just as Aloy is about to come to terms with the fact that she's heavily outnumbered and in turn probably completely helpless here, something unprecedented and very unexpected happens. A man's voice speaks to her, into her ears, through her focus. He tells her that he is an interested party, and remotely disables the focuses of all the soldiers in the dig site. Aloy is obviously mistrustful of him, but questions about this man and how he's able to communicate with her are not a priority for her right now. She sees an opportunity and she grabs it. With their focuses disabled, Aloy manages to kill all the soldiers and destroy the corruptors at which point she finally comes face to face with Olin. Olin tells Aloy that the group of mysterious killers is actually the Eclipse, a religious fanatical cult that also happens to secretly lead the Shadow Kaja behind the scenes, the rebel sect that broke off from the Kaja after the Mad Sun King's death. The man who almost killed Aloy at the Proving and is responsible for Rost's death is Helis. The Eclipse, Olin reveals, adhere to a mysterious entity known as Hades, who they call the Buried Shadow from ancient Kaja mythology. Hades, as it turns out, is who or what gives the Eclipse the ability to not only control and corrupt machines, but also to revive machines that have already been dead. One such type of machine that the Eclipse have been trying to excavate and revive is the Deathbringer. It's as ominous and dangerous as it sounds. This leads Aloy to the conclusion that the Eclipse are trying to build up an army. Not just of Deathbringers, but all sorts of machines, presumably to destroy the Kaja and take back Meridian. When Aloy presses Olin for more information, he tells her that that is all he knows about Hades. He's never actually seen it, but he tells her that he has indeed heard its voice once before, when it first saw Aloy through Olin's focus right before the proving and identified her as a threat. Olin describes Hades' voice as the metallic, evil voice of a devil. Aloy, however, is more interested in other information. She demands to know more about the woman she had seen earlier, the woman who looks basically like an older version of herself. Olin tells Aloy that he has no idea who the woman is, but does inform her that he has seen a picture of her before in some ruins of the Old Ones at a place called Maker's End. And so, Aloy heads to Maker's End. And that is where Horizon Zero Dawn starts revealing some massive revelations, as the mysteries behind the machines, the mysterious woman and everything else start unraveling. At Mother's End, Aloy fights off against a number of Eclipse soldiers and Eclipse-controlled machines. 
and eventually she finally makes it into the ruins. And in there, she makes some stunning discoveries. The woman that Aloy has been looking for is called Dr. Elizabeth Sobeck, and she's been dead for over a thousand years. It all started 1,000 years ago with a man named Ted Faro, who was the CEO of a company known as Faro Automated Solutions, or FAS. At first, FAS was known throughout the world for its construction of green robots and environment cleanup and detoxification projects, which were spearheaded by a young, brilliant scientist named Elizabeth Sobeck. Close to the end of the 2040s, FAS had become the richest corporation in the world. As per Ted Faro's wishes, though, FAS moved away from their environmental projects and instead started working on military robotic contracts. As a sign of protest, Elizabeth Sobeck left FAS. Over the next 20 years, FAS built and sold countless military robots known as peacekeepers to its clients, ranging from private militaries and nations to transgovernmental organizations and corporations while also covertly facilitating global conflicts to increase their own business and profits and sales of these machines. In 2064, though, something unexpected happened, something that changed the course of history forever. Ted Faro discovered a glitch in the machines that was causing them to go haywire. The machines had been built to be able to consume biomass in small quantities to be able to fuel themselves in emergencies. What's more, they were even capable of self-replication, and also had the ability to hack into other automated machines and weapons and bring them under their own control, quite like the Corruptors. And quite predictably, things went very, very wrong. The glitch in the system of the Peacekeeper robots severed their chain of command protocols, meaning that they no longer answered to anyone but themselves. The Peacekeepers started consuming biomass in large, frightening quantities, while also replicating at an extremely high rate. Due to the glitch, which went on to be known as the Faro Plague, they were now ignoring stand-down commands. And thanks to the fact that, by Faro's own commands, there was no back door built into their programming, FAS programmers had no means to shut them down or regain control. Desperate to put a stop to this catastrophe before word got out of how exactly it had even started, Ted Faro contacted Dr. Sobeck, asking her to look for a solution. Elizabeth Sobeck discovered that at the rate the machines were consuming biomass and replicating themselves, they would strip the Earth completely clean with a frighteningly short time of 15 months. Not just of humans, but of everything. All of its flora and fauna. Life would simply cease to exist. Things clearly were not looking good, but Elizabeth managed to do exactly what Faro had expected her to do. She came up with a way to stop the swarm of machines, which came to be known as the Faro Swarm. How? Through something known as Project Zero Dawn. However, Zero Dawn, whatever it was, didn't sit right with Ted Faro. He balked at the audacity and extremity of whatever it was that Zero Dawn entailed, and at first he refused to sign off on the idea. Elizabeth, however, told him that he had no choice. Either he signs off on Zero Dawn and agrees to fund the project, or else Elizabeth reveals to the entire world that Ted Faro is responsible for the Faro Plague. To save his own ass, Faro gave in and agreed, after which Elizabeth Sobeck told him that she was heading to US Robot Command to discuss these new developments with the powers that be. But what is Project Zero Dawn? Clearly, Elizabeth Sobeck was successful in her attempts to build whatever it was, Otherwise, the world would be completely ruined, and there would be no life on Earth whatsoever. But what exactly was it? That is exactly what Aloy doesn't know, and exactly what she needs to find out if she's to connect all the dots. The derangement, the eclipse, Elizabeth Sobeck, the attack at the proving, it's all clearly connected. And the key to finding all the answers to Aloy's questions is clearly this Project Zero Dawn. The mysterious man who had contacted Aloy earlier through her focus contacts her again. Upon being questioned, he tells her his name is Silence, and describes himself as a lone wanderer who left his tribe a long time ago in search of knowledge and answers to some very important questions. For years, Silence has been singularly focused on uncovering the mystery of what happened to the old ones, and what brought about their fall. 
He tells Aloy that there is a chance that Elizabeth Sobek might still be alive, citing the medical and technological advancements that the Old Ones had made as the reason for this belief. He passingly mentions cryogenics as a method that Dr. Sobek may have used to keep herself alive. Clearly, Silens is not someone who can be trusted, but seeing as his interests and those of Aloy's are currently aligned, Aloy decides to go along with whatever it is he is doing. She decides to follow the trail of Elizabeth Sobek and head for US Robot Command, a place that is now another one of the Old One's ruins and is now known as the Grave Horde. When she arrives at the Grave Horde, she fights off an entire horde of Eclipse soldiers as well as their corrupted machines, and after doing so, she finally makes it into the ruins. Inside, Aloy learns of something known as Operation Enduring Victory. A thousand years ago, Operation Enduring Victory was the unified global war effort that was designed to fight against and push back the Faro Swarm, in order to give Elizabeth Sobek and her team the time to build Zero Dawn, which the entire population of the world at large believed to be a superweapon that would help defeat the machines. The human race suffered unspeakable losses, numbering in the billions, as a result of Operation Enduring Victory. The machines were too many, and too powerful to be defeated through conventional warfare. What's worse, the collective armies of the world couldn't use most of the technological advancements they had made to their advantage in combat against the Faro Swarm. Not only did the robots have the ability to self-replicate and consume biomass as fuel, but they also had the ability to hack into and take control of other machines. Basically, anything automated that was thrown at the Faro Swarm, they would hijack and take over. Robots couldn't do the fighting for Operation Enduring Victory. They had to rely on old-fashioned military tactics, which obviously wasn't working out for them very well. But the people who fought in the operation were motivated. They were ready to give up their lives, because they knew that doing so would help buy more time for Elizabeth Sobek and her team to complete Zero Dawn, the super weapon that would win the war. But what the hell is Zero Dawn? Well, we still don't know. Aloy is contacted by Silence once again, and the two determine that to find out what Zero Dawn was, Aloy will have to find and travel to an orbital launch base that was being used as a base of operations by Elizabeth Sobek and her team for the development of Zero Dawn. That, however, is easier said than done, because the ruins of the launch base are located directly underneath the palace at Sunfall, which is the capital city of the Shadow Kaja regime and hence would be teeming with members of the Eclipse. And it's not even as if Aloy can sneak past them. Why, you ask? Well, because all of these Eclipse agents would be wearing focuses, meaning that the moment they saw her, Hades would see her too, and that would be the end of, well, everything she and Silence had been working towards. Aloy tells Silence to simply disable their focuses, just as he did back at the dig site when he first came into contact with her. Silence, however, tells her that it's not that simple. This time around, at Sunfall, there would be way too many focuses in a single place, meaning that there'd be an entire network of them, and taking down an entire network remotely would be next to impossible. Eloy asks him if there's a way to crash the network, and Silence tells her that that might indeed be possible, thanks to the fact that there's a weak point in the network. Silence sends the location data of the weak point to Eloy's focus, and sends her to head there. When she reaches the place, she sneaks and fights her way through countless Eclipse soldiers, before ultimately getting to the physical location of the network's weak point. When she gets there, though, she finds out, much to her surprise, that Hades is also in the area. She hears its voice, identifying her as a threat to itself. And as Aloy destroys the focus network of the Eclipse, Hades orders every machine and Eclipse soldier in the vicinity to kill Aloy. Somehow, after an intense sequence that sees Aloy fighting and fleeing her way through the Eclipse encampment, where she has more close calls than you can count on your fingers, Aloy manages to escape. Once she does, however, she furiously blames Silence for knowingly sending her into an area where he knew Hades would be as well, and in turn knew would be extremely dangerous for her. Silence admits to this, and tells her that it was a risk that had to be taken. Aloy's belief that Silence cannot be trusted becomes stronger, but with the Eclipse's focus network now down, she can concentrate on what's most important, 
getting to the Zero Dawn launch base in Sunfall. Having destroyed the focus network of the Eclipse, Aloy eventually makes her way to and sneaks through Sunfall, the capital city of the Shadow Karcher, and surprisingly enough she's able to get inside the Zero Dawn launch base without attracting any attention. And here, she finally learns the truth of Zero Dawn, and exactly what it is. At the Grave Horde, Aloy had learned about Operation Enduring Victory, and how despite their devastating and catastrophic losses, the people of the world still very much bought into the operation. This was because they knew that even in spite of all their losses, no matter how cataclysmic they may seem, they were still successfully buying time for Elizabeth Sobek and her team to finish working on Zero Dawn, the super weapon that would destroy the Faro Swarm and put an end to the war. However, Project Zero Dawn was no super weapon. The entire public at large had been lied to in order to give them hope and to give them a reason to keep fighting. As part of Operation Enduring Victory itself, so what exactly was Zero Dawn? We've already discussed how the machines, at the rate that they were consuming biomass and self-replicating, would strip the Earth clean in the span of just 15 months. Using nukes obviously would not have been an option. The machines were self-replicating, which meant that there were too many of them. And using that many nukes to stop them would effectively be as bad as letting them consume the entire planet's biomass. The only other way to put an end to the Faro Plague would have been to break through the glitch that had caused it in the first place. But as it turns out, even with all the AIs and technological prowess at their disposal, it would take at least 50 years to go through the millions of variables of code and lines of programming and finally find the code that would correct the glitch. That is where Project Zero Dawn came in. Zero Dawn was never supposed to stop the Faro Plague, at least not the way everyone thought it would. As it turns out, all life on Earth was completely wiped out a thousand years ago. The Faro Swarm consumed the planet's entire ecosystem, destroying all humans, all flora and fauna, all life. The function of Zero Dawn was to initially keep working on finding a way to break through the glitch, even after all life had perished. And once the Faro machines had been finally disabled, to reconstruct the Earth's ecosystem and eventually reintroduce human, plant and animal life onto the planet with the help of preserved DNA, samples and seeds, ultimately ensuring that even after the cataclysmic events that had been brought about by the Faro Plague, life would still go on. All of Zero Dawn was essentially a massive global system of underground bunkers and facilities capable of cloning and automated manufacturing, and at the center of this entire network was a hyper-powerful AI known as Gaia. While Gaia's own main purpose was to break the code that had caused the glitch in the Faro Swarm, she had nine subcomponents, nine more AIs that each had their own unique functions as well. For instance, there was Apollo, which was supposed to archive everything to do with human culture and the history of the world for the education of future human generations, whenever they will be able to be born, or made, rather. This way they would be able to learn all of their ancestors' technologies and advancement, and also to learn from their mistakes. Where did this archive go then? What happened to Apollo, and why is so little now known of the old ones? We'll get to that in a while. Then there were AIs like Poseidon and Aether, responsible for the cleansing of the Earth's seas and oceans, and the detoxification of the atmosphere, respectively. There was Demeter, which was responsible for the replanting of the Earth from cryogenically preserved seed stocks. There was Eleuthia, which was dedicated to the cloning and raising of humans from genetic and DNA samples once the planet was habitable again. This was to be done in underground facilities that were scattered throughout the planet. There was Minerva. Once Gaia was done with figuring out what the code to break the Faro Swarm's glitch was, Minerva would shut down all the killer robots by broadcasting it globally through several massive communication arrays, which it was also responsible for the construction of. Another AI subfunction of Gaia's was called Artemis, which was supposed to reintroduce animal life into the Earth's ecosystem. However, Artemis was only programmed to do so for what were called pioneer organisms, the fundamental organisms, if you will. The basic building blocks. Everything from microorganisms to the likes of fish, insects, foxes, rabbits, boars, turkeys and the like. More and more animal species were supposed to be reintroduced by later generations of humans, who would do so based on the knowledge passed down to them by Apollo. Obviously that didn't pan out, 
and again we'll get to why that happened in a bit. One of the most important subfunctions of Gaia was Hephaestus, and its responsibility was a heavy one. It was supposed to oversee and facilitate the terraforming of the Earth once the Pharaoh swarm had been shut down, and it was supposed to do so with the help of a number of its own line of new machines, all of which it was supposed to design, manufacture, and deploy itself. These machines would then be used by other AIs for whatever purpose they saw fit in order to facilitate their own functions. So why couldn't the scientists working on Zero Dawn just build machines themselves which could later be used by Gaia? Well, because they didn't want to leave behind a bunch of outmoded and outdated machinery that Gaia may or may not be able to properly make use of. Their purpose was to empower Hephaestus, and in turn Gaia, to design and build any and all machines it might need for any conceivable purpose. The question though is if Gaia's main purpose above all else was to ensure the preservation of life on Earth, why are machines developed by Hephaestus suddenly attacking humans? In other words, what exactly caused the derangement? Moving away from the questions for a while, let's talk about the implications of all this. The most important of these implications, perhaps, is this, that other than a few machines such as the Corruptors and the Deathbringers, all the others were not manufactured by Faro Automated Solutions, but by Gaia herself. This also explains why all the Faro machines are usually found buried beneath the ground, as opposed to the machines made by Hephaestus, since the Earth's terraforming took place after the Faro swarm had been shut down. Something else you should note. These Faro robots were among the very machines, new and unknown to the people that now inhabit the world, that started resurfacing close to 20 years ago, when the derangement of the machines first began. Why? You'll find out soon enough. And then there's Hades. Yes, as you might have figured out by now, this Hades is an AI. In fact, it's one of the AIs that was designed as a subfunction of Gaia herself. So what's the purpose of Hades? Well, Hades was basically an extinction failsafe protocol, a hard reset button if the need for one ever arose. Basically, if there were any errors, any flaws, any unforeseen and unwanted elements in the terraforming process, anything that would make the conditions unfavorable for life, Hades would take over, destroy the biosphere once again, and allow Gaia to start over. But clearly that is not what's happening right now. There was clearly no fault in the biosphere, since life was indeed successfully developed. So why is Hades trying to bring about another extinction event now? And why is it helping the Shadow Karja in their efforts to take back Meridian? Why does it want to kill Aloy? Something has caused Hades to go off script, and Aloy still doesn't know what that is. So, yeah. Everyone related to Project Zero Dawn, including Elizabeth Sobek and Ted Faro, knew that the human race and all other life forms on the planet were doomed to extinction. And there was nothing anyone could do to change that. There just wasn't enough time. And so they resigned themselves to be completely wiped out by the Faro swarm but not without ensuring that life would still have a future on Earth, no matter how far away that might be. What an ambitious reveal, right? Talk about escalation. Even despite having made all these discoveries though, there is much Aloy still doesn't know. Who or what developed Aloy? Is Elizabeth Sobek still alive, as Silence had suggested she might be? What caused the derangement of the machines? Why, if Zero Dawn was a success, is the world in its current, primal, tribal state? To get all the answers to these questions, Aloy determines that she has to go to the sacred mountain in the Nora Valley, behind the door that the Nora adhered to, the very place Aloy came from. Remember how Aloy couldn't get past that door before due to a glitch in its system? Well, now she can. At the orbital launch base in Sunfall, Aloy downloads a registry into her focus from the office of Elizabeth Sobek herself, which means that she finally has access to get past the door. Before Aloy can leave the launch base though, she is ambushed and captured by Eclipse forces. She wakes up to find herself in a cage, face to face with Helis, the leader of the Eclipse, and the man who had almost killed her at the Proving. Aloy listens to some of his fanatical babble about how she was meant to survive all of his attacks, so that she can now be captured and offered as sacrifice to Hades and the Sun. Aloy tries to speak some sense into him, telling him that it's a machine that cares nothing about the War of the Karja and the Shadow Karja, 
and wants nothing more than the complete extinction and annihilation of all life on Earth. Predictably, Helis doesn't listen to her. He tells her that after Aloy crashed the Focus Network, Helis gathered his Eclipse forces, rallying all his soldiers, and mounted an invasion of the Nora's sacred land. He ordered every single Nora killed, with hopes that he would find and catch Aloy there. Having found her in Sunfall itself, though, Helis accepts that the attack on the sacred land, which is currently underway, was ultimately unneeded. Regardless, he mockingly tells her that even if he wanted to, he couldn't just recall the attack, since long-distance communication is now impossible thanks to Aloy's destruction of the Focus Network. With this, Helis drops Aloy into an arena of sorts, and releases a massive machine known as a behemoth upon her. After a long, grueling fight, Aloy manages to survive by the skin of her teeth, and is able to defeat the behemoth. Helis is, as you might have guessed, not happy. He releases two more corrupted machines, this time corruptors, into the arena, and orders them to kill Aloy. And just as it seems that she might finally be overwhelmed, Silence rides to her rescue. The gates of the arena blast apart, and Silence rides in with several controlled machines. He grabs Aloy, and before they can be attacked, the two of them ride away as fast as they possibly can, while several of Silence's own machines stay back to hold off the corruptors. With no time to waste, what with the Nora under attack by a veritable force of Eclipse soldiers and corrupted machines, Aloy rushes to the Sacred Land. When she gets there, she sees that the attack is worse than she could have imagined. There's machines and Eclipse soldiers everywhere. Entire settlements and villages have been burned to the ground, and there's been a lot of casualties, with very few Nora Braves still left alive. With Aloy's help, though, the Nora are successfully able to defeat the Eclipse and their machines, ensuring that even though they might have broken through into Nora territory, they would never make it out. Having held off this devastating attack, Aloy enters the Sacred Mountain, but before she proceeds further, she speaks with Matriarch Tiersa, hoping to get the answers to some burning questions. Questions about Rost. More specifically, about why he was made an outcast. Tissa reveals that many years ago, even before Aloy was born, before Rost was an outcast, he had a family, a wife and a daughter. One day, however, a band of twelve murderous outlanders struck the village where they used to live, killed his wife and took several villagers, among Rost's own daughter, hostage. Eventually, all of these hostages were killed by the murderers, including Rost's daughter and the bandits left their corpses right outside the boundaries of the Nora's sacred land as a mockery of sorts, because they knew the Nora would not break their laws and cross their boundaries, even to the bodies, or to give chase to the bandits themselves. Rost was racked by grief, but he could still not bring himself to break the sacred laws of his tribe, and so he asked the matriarchs to make him a death seeker, essentially a seeker who has a license to kill, but ceases to be part of the tribe, and is never allowed to return to Noraland. Wounded and on the precipice of death, he returned to the Sacred Land. By law, the matriarchs were supposed to drive him out, since in becoming a Death Seeker, he had given up being a part of the tribe. The matriarchs, however, could not bring themselves to do so, and so they made an exception. They allowed Ross to live among the Nora, but as an outcast. Eventually, Aloy enters the heart of the Sacred Mountain, where she is finally able to get past the door, and here all her lingering questions are answered. Aloy learns that this facility behind this door is the main Eleuthia Cradle facility, where new human beings were developed by the Eleuthia AI. More importantly though, Aloy discovers what exactly happened that caused Gaia to lose control of her subsystems. While Gaia had been functioning exactly as she ought to, with no errors in her system and no faults in any of her subfunctions, everything changed 20 years ago. Why, you ask? About two decades ago, Gaia received a mysterious transmission, one originating from an unknown source. The transmission caused all her subordinate AIs to break free from her control, becoming self-aware and erratic. Due to this error in her system, Hades attempted to seize control of the terraforming system and reverse it to bring about another extinction and complete obliteration of the Earth's ecosystem, something it was originally designed to do, but was now attempting to needlessly carry out due to the transmission of unknown origin. 
Unwilling to let Hades bring about another extinction event, Gaia commanded the reactor in the facility that housed her AI core, known as Gaia Prime, to self-destruct. She calculated that this would destroy her, and in turn, Hades as well. While this would successfully stop Hades from bringing about an extinction event, this would also mean that in Gaia's absence, her subfunctions would eventually malfunction and begin operating in a chaotic way that could ultimately be about as dangerous and harmful to all life on Earth. She is, of course, referring to the derangement, but we'll get to that in just a bit. To make sure that that didn't happen, Gaia activated another failsafe. She ordered the Eleuthia Cradle Facility to develop a genetic clone of Elizabeth Sobek, which is how Eloy was born. Having the same DNA makeup as Elizabeth, this clone would be able to enter the Eleuthia facility inside the Sacred Mountain and view a message left behind by Gaia explaining everything. Ultimately, with access to all Zero Dawn facilities, this clone, Aloy, would be able to rebuild the system core and hence rebuild Gaia. This also explains why Hades has wanted Aloy dead all along. However, even though Gaia triggered an explosion in the Gaia Prime facility, thus destroying her own core, she was somehow unable to destroy Hades. How? Hades reacted in a most unusual way, presumably due to the same mysterious transmission that set it free in the first place, and launched a virus that destroyed the lines of code that kept it shackled to Gaia Prime. Hades escaped to an unknown location, and though it was significantly weaker without the core functions and links to Gaia, it still managed to survive. Hades' virus, however, corrupted a whole lot of data in Gaia's systems, including the Alpha Registry and DNA Security System at Cradle Facilities, which is what had caused the door inside the Sacred Mountain to remain locked for so long. Eloy finds out that there is a Master Override located at Gaia Prime, and it is effectively the only thing that can possibly stop Hades anymore, what with Gaia having been destroyed. Let's take a step back for a moment and talk about the derangement in some detail. 20 years ago, when Gaia destroyed her own core, all her subfunctions became self-aware. This included Hephaestus, the AI that was responsible for the creation of machines for any and all purposes that Gaia could possibly conceive. When Gaia was destroyed, though, there was no longer anything left to govern the systems and functions of Hephaestus. Though humans and Gaia's machines had always survived in peaceful coexistence, humans sometimes used to hunt machines for parts and scrap, as they do even now. Hephaestus took this as signs of aggression, and thus began programming machines to become more aggressive themselves, so that they could defend themselves. What's more, it also began designing and creating machines specifically for combat situations, including the likes of Sawtooths and Thunderjaw. This is exactly why all these larger, more dangerous types of machines first came into existence two decades ago. This phenomenon, along with the increased aggression of the machines, came to be known as the derangement. With all this information, Aloy finally heads for Gaia Prime in search for the Master Override, and it's at Gaia Prime that the final pieces of the puzzle fall into place. The first question that's answered is, what happened to Elizabeth Sobek? 1,000 years ago, after the destruction of the world at the hands of the Faro Swarm was complete, and the remaining scientists of Project Zero Dawn were living out the rest of their days within Gaia Prime, Gaia informed them that due to a system malfunction, one of the doors of the facility had failed to shut completely. As such, signals were escaping the facility, and the Faro Swarm, having become aware of their presence, was barreling down on their location. Elizabeth Sobek sacrificed herself, wearing an environmental suit and going outside of the facility, manually closing the door herself. The other burning question that has remained unanswered until now is, what happened to Apollo, the massive archive of past human knowledge that was supposed to educate the future generations of humans? Well, remember Ted Faro? Yeah, that douchebag. He deleted the entire archive wiping out thousands of years' worth of knowledge and consigning future human generations to complete ignorance, absolute lack of technology and scientific knowledge, and thus, tribal lifestyles. Supposedly, he did this because he wanted to make sure that future generations didn't repeat the same mistakes that their ancestors and Ted Farah himself had made. Oh, and what do you know? 
This also meant that human beings in the future would also never know that everything that happened was basically his fault. How convenient, right? This is also why the AI Artemis had been unable to reintroduce anything beyond pioneer organisms into the Earth's ecosystem, because all knowledge of all other species of flora and fauna had been lost with the destruction of Apollo. Eventually, Aloy finds and retrieves the Master Override, and as she's about to exit Gaia Prime, she runs into silence, and he has some confessions to make. He tells Aloy that years ago, it was him who first found and recovered Hades, or what had remained of it after Gaia's explosion. Curious for knowledge as he always has been, Silence repaired Hades, and the AI made a deal with the man. Silence would give as much information and knowledge as he had of the new world to Hades in exchange for that of the old one, which explains why Silence has always known so much about so much. It is also revealed that it was Silence himself who had first developed the Eclipse. Why? Well, the Eclipse were essentially pawns that Hades planned to use to get to its ultimate goal. Eventually, Hades decided that Silence had outlived his usefulness in order to have him killed. Ever since then, Silence has been living on as a fugitive. But what exactly is Hades' ultimate goal? Remember Minerva, one of Gaia's sub-functions? Its function was to develop a massive communication array that would broadcast the code that would shut down the Pharaoh Swarm. One such communication array is the Spire, the massive monolithic tower in Meridian we spoke of earlier. Hades wants to use the Spire to broadcast a signal to reawaken the Pharaoh robots bring them back above ground and start yet another extinction event by making them consume the planet's biomass and ecosystem once again. The Shadow Kaja and the Eclipse, who believe that Hades has been helping them in their war against the Kaja, and will ultimately help them take back Meridian, have been nothing but unwitting but all too willing pawns all along. Hades obviously couldn't care less about whether or not the Shadow Kaja take back Meridian, it only wants to use them to get to the Spire. Silence tells Aloy that he wants to make amends for the major involvement he had in everything that has happened. While Aloy, along with us, the players, can be sure that that is hardly the complete truth, it is still Silence, after all. Now is hardly the time to mistrust the only help she's about to receive. Silence hands her his own lance, and tells her that she can attach the Master Override to it, and then plunge it into Hades' core to destroy the AI once and for all. Silence departs on this note, and Aloy begins preparations for her final mission. Her last stand against all of Hades' collective might, including countless Eclipse soldiers, and an entire army of all sorts of corrupted machines. Aloy gathers all the allies she has accrued throughout her journey, and with them she comes to Meridian. Her goal is to make sure that, no matter what, Hades' forces do not make it to the Spire. That, of course, is easier said than done. When Helis arrives with Hades in tow, he arrives in full strength, with frightening aggression and focused ferocity. The attack on Meridian is brutal and terrifying, and the final section of Horizon Zero Dawn sees the forces of Meridian, Aloy, and all her allies desperately trying to push back the armies that are now crashing into them relentlessly. As such, the Eclipse soldiers manage to break through Meridian's defenses and are able to reach the Spire. They place Hades' core at the foot of the Spire, and the AI immediately begins broadcasting its signal across the globe, reawakening the Pharaoh Swarm. Deathbringers and Corruptors begin rising up from beneath the ground across the world, and immediately they start consuming biomass, everything from humans and animals to trees and insects. The extinction event from a thousand years ago, the event that destroyed all life on Earth, has started yet again. After fighting her way through the Eclipse's forces, Aloy is able to finally confront and kill Helis, and then eventually manages to reach the Spire. With the help of Meridian's soldiers, she fights against the Eclipse's forces, as well as some corrupted machines, including a terrifying Deathbringer. Ultimately, however, Aloy is able to defeat them all. She runs to Hades' core and jams Silence Lance into it, finally destroying Hades. The signal stops broadcasting. The Faro Swarm is put back to sleep, and the extinction event is brought to a halt before it can do any more damage. The people of Meridian look on and celebrate this fantastic victory. In the final moments of the game, Aloy travels to the house of Elizabeth Sobek, where she finds her corpse encased in an environmental suit. 
After she successfully resealed the Gaia Prime facility, Elizabeth was presumably able to survive the attacks of the oncoming Faro Swarm thanks to her environmental suit, and was ultimately able to make it back to her childhood home in what had once been Carson City, Nevada. At some point, it can be assumed that her environmental suit stopped functioning, and once it was no longer able to protect her from the toxic atmosphere, she eventually died. Eloy scans her corpse with her focus, and discovers an audio recording of Elizabeth conversing with Gaia. The AI asks Elizabeth what she would have wanted her child to be like if she ever had one. And in one of the most moving moments of the game, Elizabeth said that she would want to have her to be curious, willful, and unstoppable, but also compassionate enough to, in her own way, heal the world just a little bit. A perfect description of Aloy, as it turns out. Eloy closes her eyes and has a moment of mourning for the mother that she's been looking for her entire life. The woman who sacrificed herself and gave everything she had to, essentially, save the world. That's not it though, and it turns out Horizon Zero Dawn has one more curveball to throw at us before it draws the curtains. Hades, it is revealed in the game's final scene, hasn't actually been destroyed. Not completely. A straggling flare of corruption fires off from the remnants of Hades' core and flies away in a seemingly random direction. It travels a long distance before it's ultimately captured in a container of sorts by, no prizes for guessing, Silence. Silence tells Hades that there's much they still have to discuss, so much knowledge that Silence is hungry for that Hades still hasn't revealed to him, such as Hades' masters, as Silence says the ones who sent the transmission 20 years ago, the very same transmission that freed Hades of Gaia, and also led to the derangement. And that is where Horizon Zero Dawn ends. Horizon Zero Dawn's story was full of startling revelations and twists, and how that plot thickens and unravels more mysteries is going to be one of Horizon Forbidden West's biggest draws. Zero Dawn did, of course, also have a fully-fledged expansion in the form of the Frozen Wilds, and while that obviously wasn't as narratively crucial as much of what happens in the base game, it still had some pretty important plot developments that might inform Forbidden West's story in interesting ways. The Frozen Wilds is set entirely in the frosty landscape of the region known as the Cut, with the story focusing heavily on the tribe known as the Bannock. Comprised of hunters, Eloy travels to the land of this fierce tribe when she hears of strange happenings in the region, from dangerous machines attacking humans to a mountain belching out plumes of smoke. Soon after arriving in the cut, Eloy meets with Aratak, a Bannock chieftain, who tells her that people in the region have been getting attacked by an entity known only as the Daemon, who's apparently the cause of recent attacks by new and dangerous machines and is also capable of robotic towers of corruption that turn nearby machines into demonic variants. The Bannock have, as such, been embroiled in a fight with the Daemon on a mountain known as the Thunder's Drum, which houses ruins of an old world facility, though recently one of their own named Aurea disappeared and hasn't been spotted since. Hoping that Aurea will have more information on the situation, Aerloy decides to track her down. She does successfully find her soon afterward, but soon also learns about Spirit. Spirit reaches out to Aurea after Aerloy tracks her down, and urgently informs that its communications are being blocked by the demon, before then being cut off. Upon learning more about the Spirit and its relationship with the Bannock from Aurea, and realizing that the AI could be the key to what's happening with the demon, Aerloy decides to join forces and rescue Spirit, to do that, however, the two of them are going to need aid from the Bannock, which is going to prove a little complicated, because under orders from Chieftain Aratak, who, as it turns out, is Aurea's brother, the tribe has become adamant in its refusal to go to Thunder's Drum, which is where the Daemon has built its base of operations, so to speak. Realizing that she needs to take on Aratak and replace him as the local warrior's de facto leader, Aerloy challenges the Chieftain, but their fight is cut off when the group is attacked by the Daemon's machines. Aerloy and Aratak work together to bring the attacking machines down, and impressed by how she carries herself in combat, Aratak decides to cede leadership to Aerloy. 
Soon afterward, the two of them head to Thunder's drum with Aurea, and in the ruins of the Old World facility, several key details come to light. For starters, the demon is Hephaestus, a subfunction of the Gaia, the AI that was in charge of Project Zero Dawn and the restoration and reseeding of the planet after the Pharaoh Plague wiped it out. When Gaia was forced to self-destruct due to a mysterious rogue signal, all of its AI subfunctions became independent and self-aware, including Hephaestus, the subfunction that was responsible for creating machines that Gaia had used to rebuild, reseed, and maintain the planet's new biosphere. Since it became self-aware, though, Hephaestus began registering humans who would regularly hunt machines for their parts and components as hostile to its creations. In a process that became known by the human population as the derangement, Hephaestus began outfitting its machines with weapons and creating more deadly kinds that would fight back against any attackers and be better equipped to kill humans. Eventually, that led to the AI creating new machines that were built specifically for the purpose of hunting humans, like the deadly Ursine Fireclaw. Spirit, meanwhile, is an entirely separate AI, for which we're going to have to go back to the planet as it was before it was destroyed by the Pharaoh Plague. In the mid-21st century, it was discovered that the Yellowstone Caldera was on the verge of becoming unstable and potentially destroying the planet. Led by Elizabeth Sobeck, who would later go on to mastermind Project Zero Dawn, and funded by Ted Faro, who was incidentally responsible for the Faro Plague, Project Firebreak was established. The top-secret government project entailed the construction of an underground facility that used special technologies and was run and overseen by a fully-fledged AI that was responsible, first and foremost, for keeping the Caldera's activities in check. That AI was called the Caldera of Yellowstone Analytic Nexus, or Cyan, and would later go on to become known to the Bannock as Spirit, and the location of Project Firebreak would become known as Thunder's Drum. When the Faro Plague came about and Project Zero Dawn and Operation Enduring Victory were put into place to restore the planet after its inevitable destruction, Cyan was put into hibernation. The AI would go on to spend several centuries in isolation upon reactivation, completely unaware of the state of the world, before eventually coming into contact with the Bannock through Aurea. Eventually, about five years before the events of the Frozen Wilds, Cyan received a direct communications request, and hoping that it was from more technologically advanced humans from another location, accepted the request. The request, as it turns out, was from Hephaestus. By this time, the AI was well into the phenomenon that became known as the Derangement, and it viewed the fully automated firebreak facility at Thunder's Drum as the perfect location to build a cauldron with which to manufacture deadly machines in larger numbers. When Cyan accepted the communications request from Hephaestus, it was immediately flooded and crippled with malicious control. The far more advanced Hephaestus was able to easily subdue Cyan and bring it under its control and turned Thunder's Drum into a cauldron for the mass production of human hunting machines such as Fireclaws. Aloy, Uria, and Aratak arrive at the facility and fight their way through the cauldron, with their plan being to get Aloy to use their technology to override the facility and free Cyan from Hephaestus. They fight through formidable hordes of deadly machines and their corrupted demonic variants, and though that fight ends in Uria's death, her sacrifice helps override Cyan's core. The AI instantly transfers itself to a different facility, while taking auxiliary control of the firebreak facility with it. At the same time, knowing that Hephaestus is using the cauldron there to mass-produce fireclaws and send them out into the world, Cyan activates a self-destruct sequence in the cauldron as well. Aloy and Aratak escape as the cauldron is destroyed in their wake. And that's where the Frozen Wilds ends. The cauldron at Thunder's Drum has been destroyed, but Hephaestus is still out there somewhere. Its location is unknown, but Aloy does know that the AI still plans on building killer machines with the express purpose of hunting humans. 
Meanwhile, with auxiliary control of the firebreak facility, Cyan remains in control of its functions, and is confident that it'll be able to keep the Yellowstone caldera in check for at least another 3,000 years. Aloy, meanwhile, puts Aratek back in charge of the Bannock and leaves the cut. How much of a role these narrative beats will have to play in Horizon Forbidden West remains to be seen. We don't know yet if the Bannock will be returning in any capacity, and it's unlikely that the cut will be featured at all. That said, Hephaestus is clearly an integral part of the larger story Gorilla is telling in the Horizon games, and we'd be very surprised if the AI didn't show up in the upcoming sequel at all. That said, it should be interesting to see how crucial that particular thread will be to the main story. And there it is, the complete story of Horizon from start to finish. There is, however, so much we still didn't speak about, so much that was featured quite prominently in the game, but was ultimately not that essential to the larger story. Important characters like Val and Warchief Sona, memorable, well-written secondary quests that did an excellent job in developing not just the game's lore and background conflicts, but also some of the game's most important supporting characters, such as Eren. There's also quite a bit of lore and background information that we still haven't touched on. And really, that's the beauty of Horizon Zero Dawn. We still haven't talked about everything the game has to offer narratively. As such, if there's anything you think was important to the game's story but we didn't talk about, please tell us about it in the comments section below. We hope you enjoyed this series. And with that, we've reached the end of this video. Have anything to say? Let us know in the comments below. Also, we upload new videos every single day on Gaming Bolt, so please consider subscribing as it really helps us out. Thanks for watching.